Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic Indie Creator interview. It is your Cape Tree Skater. Blech. <laughs> Got tongue tied over my own intro. Let me restart that real quick. <laughs> All right, let's begin in three, two, one. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic Indie Creator interview. It is your Cape Tree Skater, Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with our brand new friend, Chuck How at least. We're here to break down. Do we have a contract and everything in between? Chuck, welcome to the show. How are you doing this morning? Oh God, I just woke up about uh, an hour ago, so, <laughs> so I'm still waking up a little bit. Yeah, we're running on similar mindsets. I, I just rolled out of bed myself. My cat was uh, trying to get me to come back to sleep, but I know if I lay back down, the second my head hits that pillow, it's game over. <laughs> so how are you doing? Welcome to today's stream. We're here to break down who you are and uh, your current book. Uh, before we dive into anything too deep, though, let's start off with the basics by breaking down who you are and how you got into creating comics. Right. Well, uh, I've always been writing and drawing. Uh, I only really started making actual comics in uh, college. I uh, started at PCC and moved over to PSU and uh, took actually comic classes with uh, Diana Schutz, who was uh, a big editor uh, at Dark Horse and uh, for a long time uh, is a comics instructor, uh, teaching uh, not how to make comics, but how to look at comics, how to analyze them, uh, their history, and I got really interested in their history. And so for the next like five years, I was uh, really focused on the academic part of the comic creation process and just just did making them uh, here and there. And uh, it was only uh, actually this year with do we have a contract that i started to make uh comics that were longer than 10 pages or little one shots so this is my uh, first really big project comic wise that is so cool to like right off the rip have someone that you could learn from like that and, and really do a deep dive on the like the history of comics like what influences did that have like on the creative process for you like starting off uh, that 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 seems like it would be such a nice way to like get a start into creating them is by learning how they were created. I think, funnily enough, one of the biggest influences is in what I'm doing away from the traditional comics. Uh, I, I see so many of them uh, that have the same sort of layouts and pacing and flow that uh, for all of my pages currently, I just like to break away from the grid, break away from the usual way of treating the reader's eyes as they go across the page mm -hmm. as much as possible. Because if you've read as many comics as I'm sure a lot of us have, you know, stare at the same thing over and over and the right papers <laughs> on the same thing over and over, you'd want to break away a little. No, absolutely. So how do we see that reflected within your work? You know, how, how are you making sure uh, you're not like making those uh, those same things that you try to avoid when reading comics? Uh, I, I actually uh, it there's some big things and some subtle things. The uh, big thing, of course, is that there are less panels uh, than, say, the average Marvel or DC book uh, for the first issue i tried to very very rarely go beyond four or five panels per page uh and what that let me do is treat them in unusual shapes mm -hmm. uh, there's one page where uh, the panels are in a stair step shape uh, to follow along with uh, him going down the stairs uh, one of the more subtle things is uh, throughout most of Volume 1, uh, as much as possible, I avoid 90 degree angles in the panel borders. Uh, I'll do it just like 1% off uh, 
and that actually comes partly from the uh, silent film aesthetic of that specific of this specific project because if you look at uh, Caligari for instance mm -hmm. everything is uh, off at an angle nothing is 90 degree everything is tilted and uh, a little off kilter to give a sort of unease and that's something that I tried to uh, replicate uh, just in the layout of the page no that is so awesome we have Dan uh, Dan Price my good friend Dan over on YouTube stopping to say good morning y'all Good morning, Dan. Welcome to the stream. How are you doing uh, this lovely, lovely day? Chuck, I love that so much. What is the, the importance of uh, doing that with the panels, like putting them off just a few degrees here and there? Like what type, what, what, like what does that do to the, the page itself? Uh, it's just a s subtle little way uh, to prevent it becoming too static. Uh, uh, that's another reason why I'm breaking away from the grid, because especially if you have as in some of these issues where there are several pages uh, that are just conversations, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, where you're like, oh, well, how are you going to make that dynamic? And uh, one good way of making a conversation dynamic is just how you present, how you view it. So uh, by just having things just a little off kilter, you can also sort of lead the reader's eye like it feels like a slope happening down say you want to draw the reader's eye to the right you make a slope a little left it becomes almost subconscious holy crap i never considered that i i, I love uh just like how deep this it, immersion goes i i would have never guessed doing that like almost tricks the reader's mind into like perceiving it that way oh yeah uh, that's one thing that uh really helped uh in coming from an academic comics background is that we all went over how to set up a page even if we weren't making the comic uh, uh, learning how to read uh, these comics from all these different areas we went over uh, uh, mainstream Marvel DC we went uh, Dark Horse we went indie little zine things uh, and throughout the entire history and just seeing how every individual creator handled their layouts and handled how they led the reader along the page really helped. So, you know, I, I, I'm really, really curious. Uh, I, yeah, I, and I'm sure uh, the, the listeners are as well for, for any, anyone that's listening, you know, when, when you read a comic, like what's some of the differences between just reading a comic and then reading the comic like you guys were? Like, what are you guys like looking for? Like, what are you focusing on that? I guess a normal person just reading a comic for the first time wouldn't even think about. Uh, it's actually mostly focused on things that the average reader is experiencing. It's just analyzing how the artist is making you feel that, making you see that. Like the thing about the slope or the angles or how the artist is leading your eye. Like that affects everybody that's reading a comic. So what we mostly focus on is what the artist and writer are doing to cause that effect. So like uh, say there's a composition where there's uh, somebody tall on the left and short on the right. Uh, that leads the eye in a specific way uh, that you normally wouldn't think about if you're Holy crap. <laughs> going through it there. But if you're analyzing it from an academic perspective, they just point it out, uh, point out like, hey, look, look what the artist is doing right here. Ma made you look. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, basically, the entire thing is just uh, pointing out the made you looks. Any anytime, uh, anytime I learn something like this, I always cherish it because I never would have guessed. I never, I had no idea. Uh, so I thank you for teaching me this piece of uh, this piece of wisdom because, like, I'm going to now start looking for that when I when I consume comics. Uh, holy crap! So let's dive back into uh, the creative process for you. Now, when you first started, you did a uh, a couple like one shot single pagers, ten page, uh, and before you started diving into larger issues. What were some of those stories like for you? Like, what were some of the concepts and uh, themes that we've seen? Almost entirely just gag comics. Uh, st starting out, before I started this project, uh, I did most of my serious work in prose. Mm -hmm. uh, some with illustrations. So I have probably novels worth of unpublished and unpublishable material. 
uh, that actually helped develop the craft in making a comic just as much as those little gag uh, strips or gag one shots helped in the uh, technical process of learning uh, where to put things on the page. No, I, I I love that a lot. You know, do we have a contract? It's, it feels like it's a lot more serious, but we still see some of that humor. I know, I think it was page nine. There was a, a dick joke. Uh, so yeah. you you pull you pull some of those uh, that that gag humor and put it into your current work. I love how uh, you have that that nod to your past work. I I feel like to make something fully rounded, even if it's a serious work, you have to include some humor. Uh, because otherwise you're just seeing a one-dimensional part of the existence and it becomes tiring if it's just page after page of uh, just depression and awful <laughs> things happening. So even in the darkest times, there's uh, people making light of things, dark humor, dark jokes, gallows humor, uh, even ridiculous slapstick. So... Uh, I feel like in order to have a serious work, you'll see uh, even uh, in literature, uh, James Joyce, you know, uh, what most people consider uh, the pinnacle of uh, postmodern stuffiness. Uh, you have to analyze every other word. Uh, he has uh, masturbation jokes in there and uh, just all sorts of humor and <laughs> plays with words i mean finnegan's wake i haven't gotten past the first chapter of that book but i could uh make out a few jokes in there <laughs> if you if you've never read finnegan's wake don't <laughs> don't <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. But, you know, I haven't had a chance to read that, but I did have a chance to read Do We Have a Contract? And that's what we're here to break down today. But I wanted to get a nice feel of who you are leading into this. So uh, with Do We Have a Contract, what is that about? Like, what type of story and comic are we seeing within this uh, creation? Uh, it actually started out with Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, which was a uh, treatise on the social contract which is yeah basically you give up something in order to get safety uh in his view he was in favor of an absolute monarch uh that and his reasoning was that oh get a very dim view of humanity oh we're all chaotic violent animals so you have <laughs> to give up some of your freedom uh to all agree to follow this absolute monarch in order to prevent civil war. And mm -hmm. he, of course, was writing this during the time of the English Civil War, so he had uh, perhaps direct reasons for that view. And this developed into considerations of fascism, why people are drawn to fascism. And I think it's a, in that sort of vein, they uh, feel like they have to give up whatever, I mean, go, going even beyond the uglier uh, Umberto Eco's uh, tennis of fa fascism part, you also have the average person, the one that who isn't maybe one of the Mussolini's, who, well, why are they drawn to fascism? And I think it's fear, basically, fear of civil war, fear of uh, the violence of other people. So they turn to violence. So, how are we seeing this, like, reflected within the comic? I know our protagonist, he has, like, some rather really, you know, it, it like, uh, deep thoughts. I, I, I know at one point, uh, he was w willing to do whatever it takes to, to make Italians stop killing other Italians. Like, it seems like there was just so much emotions uh, just, you know, displayed within this comic. It, was, it just seems like really such a deep, like, concept. Yeah, the, uh, sorry, a bit of a dry mouth there. Uh, that directly relates, I believe, uh, to the, the, the concept uh, of the Civil War. Uh, of course, in World War II, Italy was fighting against itself, the partisans and the fascists. And uh, that's one of the other origins for this entire project, is uh, researching that history. And... Yeah, it, it is uh, conflicted 
because you know on one side you have the partisans and the fascists and the other side you have uh, the americans and uh, the british uh, bombing you so even if you're on their side against the uh, fascists you have uh, incidents such as the uh, uh, bombing of a school uh, in world war ii by the american and uh, british planes which is referenced in that in that page that he's talking mm -hmm. about so he has sort of mixed uh feelings but ultimately comes down on the side of uh the fascism being the worst enemy we also see some other really interesting ties within this comic too there's uh it, it like i'm not super well versed but it seems like there's uh touches of like demonology within it uh or or aspects of like summoning like black magic type of demons uh can you give us a little bit more about that as well i i know i'm probably butchering some oh, of that yeah. so it, please excuse me oh yeah no uh <laughs> demonology is uh definitely a ma major uh concept is also ties into the idea of the contracts and the social contracts because you know in demonology uh all the way going back there's always this idea that you give up something uh, to the demons in order to make them work for you, or you enter into a binding contract that they can't uh, go against. And the primary sources uh, in this comic for those would be the... Uh, I'm trying to remember how to pronounce this. Ours, uh, the Lesser Key of Solomon uh, and the Dictionnaire Inferno. Uh, the Infernal Dictionary. Uh, it was a French tome that laid out all these demons and it had uh, lists of them, had their names, what they did, what you could get from them if you entered into a contract with them. Uh, and the Lesser Key of Solomon is a later work that uh, drops some names. Uh, sort of ritualizes it more the okay. uh in the issue the ritual that cicero goes through is actually from that work uh except instead of a scepter he uses his cane and instead of a white robe he uses bed sheets you got to make do with what you have you know <laughs> so you are not only the writer but also the artist for this as the the sole creator what does that process look like for you uh when you when you're creating these panels and these pages you know what type of influences do you draw from uh for your style uh for the style uh biggest influences uh this is two com on completely two opposite ends of the spectrum uh Sin City is, you know, the obvious one, the stark black and white, and a lot of uses of implied line and negative space. Uh, there's also Andre Franquin, uh, who was a wonderful Franco-Belgian artist, uh, <coughs> who did Spyro. I'm going to butcher the pronunciations here. I don't. I do not know French. Uh, I have. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Uh, that monster went down the wrong tube, and you're talking. I'm like trying to like not die, and I'm like, oh, I'm ruining it. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good to go. Sorry about that. Oh no, oh, good. Uh, the uh, Gaston Legaff, uh, just this wonderful cartooning. Um, that's where you see the uh, squatter proportions. Every, mm -hmm. uh, an adult in the comic is five heads tall and sort of cartoony. Uh, uh, and I have several volu volumes of these wonderful examples of cartooning. I cannot read any of them because they're all in French. Uh, <laughs> but the jokes almost all still come across. He was just that much of a master of the visual storytelling part of it. That I'm, I'm still reading these. I can't understand a single word, but I get what's happening and I'm laughing. And just wonderful line work and brush work. Mm -hmm. uh, and pen work. I, I used to, uh, when I did traditional, I worked in brush and ink, and I s still try to get that a little bit with uh, digital, but it's difficult. No, that is, that is awesome. And you know, the, the protagonist of the story did learn English by reading magazines, so maybe you could do the same uh, with uh, the, the French work. <laughs> it's actually a common thing I've heard, uh, and I have friends who uh, will 
have said the same thing that uh, just growing up they'd uh, learn it from uh, television yes from yep books uh, so just thought it was funny but of course uh, the language in magazines and the language in a demonology book aren't quite the same so he has a little bit of trouble <laughs> Hey, well, speaking of trouble, let's go ahead and why not dive in to the very first, uh, the very first issue and kind of get a look at what we're here to, to, to talk about today. So let me go ahead and uh, switch over here. Dan Price over on YouTube uh, asking what programs uh, do you use for drawing? Like, uh, so what do you use uh, to create your art? Uh, for all the art, I use just Photoshop. Uh, I've been looking into the clip paint studio but i haven't quite moved over so i'm just sticking to photoshop because that's how i touched up uh when i did traditional and i would still draw that way like say oh i need to redraw this entire panel but i don't want to go back to my drawing board mm -hmm. and go back to scan so i just draw it digitally and try and get a traditional look so for this one is all photoshop uh, the lettering is an illustrator. That is really impressive. That is impressive that you made. You you have eight issues out currently that, that was all created on uh, Photoshop? Yes. Holy crap, man. That is awesome. So for anyone that is watching, there is a adult content warning. Uh, just heads up, contained in the series is sensitive content, including slurs related to race, religion, and or sexual orientation. This, pre this is presented in a historical context, and there's no way representing uh, the beliefs of the author uh you know just that quick heads up uh so i really liked you know uh, you said uh, it had uh influences from uh sin city just like how like dark these inks are i i, I really love like the contrast and, and and the overall feeling of it oh yeah that's great and i i love the uh uh we'll, we'll get into a little further but uh one of the things I love about Sin City is its use of implied line, which mm -hmm. uh, if you look at that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth thack, the sixth word right there on thack. It's uh, black? Uh, no, the uh, two over to the left. Uh, yeah, there. You'll see the uh, building to the right is not completely drawn in, but your eye just sort of fills it in. holy crap dude <laughs> that is that that is remarkable i uh, that it's like a it's like an optical illusion almost so what is this uh tick thack what is this supposed to be representing right now oh um every single issue has a sort of um starts with a, a repeated ambiguous sound effect uh now, I've gotten multiple uh, interpretations of this. Uh, one was they thought at first that it was a, a ticking bomb, which is appropriate. And you'll find out uh, on the last panel of this page what it's actually coming from is his cane, which is clarified in the second page, where it's uh, the tick thack is beside the cane. So what what is going on in this scene? Are we seeing, like... Uh someone's like searching in like the rubbles of like ruined cities like after a bombing like what's what's going on in this uh, particular page oh this is uh scenes of milan uh during the near the end of world war ii uh milan during that time had was the recipient of an extensive bombing campaign uh this was uh, one of the last refuges of Mussolini. Uh, he had set up a sort of puppet state propped up by the Nazi government. Uh, so they were the t uh, target of a lot of military campaigns. Yeah, I'm really loving just uh, this artwork. And li li like you said, uh, you, you don't like the traditional like uh, paneling and, and, and that's evident the way these pages are designed uh you know was it hard to, to to keep like this page layout like to 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 draw this concept up like this or uh did it was it just something that just came natural uh m most of them come fairly quickly uh sometimes it takes a little bit of puzzling and moving around as i think oh that doesn't lead the reader's eye in the correct direction or oh mm -hmm. that's sort of ambiguous like on this page right here uh, the 
tic tac uh, foot and cane was originally below the cathedral there but i moved it up because i felt that that led the reader's eye more you'll see that it goes from top to bottom um uh, which uh i feel leads you down uh better uh, mm -hmm. as an overview like your uh, a bird's eye view looking over the cathedral I really like the implied lines too. Like the, the the more I look at this art, the more I'm like trying to like force myself to see it. Uh, and 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 it's such a unique way to design the pages. Like we're you know not having to fully detail buildings and flesh out buildings and just letting lines you know trick the reader's mind into doing it for you. Like that's awesome. So right here we have an interesting dialogue happening uh, about an interesting dagger. So what's this dagger about? This is a chincadea, and it is actually a sword I have for years wanted to incorporate into a story because it is such an interesting sort of weapon. Uh, it is named for its uh, width at the base, which is five fingers, and there's actually a little bit of debate on whether it is considered a short sword or a dagger uh, <laughs> because there are examples of vastly uh, varying lengths and uh, the reason uh, the story reason for this blade in particular is uh, elaborated on a few pages later where he uh, mentions that it's something that never caught on outside Italy and it only really lasted for a few decades so it's sort of linking it to Mussolini's government in a way and uh, as an instrument of violence uh, is thematically relevant for the rest of the series. And uh, we're introduced to uh, Antonio and he uh, he takes our protagonist uh, under his his uh, his wing. I just noticed the uncanny uh, yarn right here. That is awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, he takes him under his wing, but he's kind of like a jerk. What you know? What was your reasoning for having Antonio be like this? He he's rough and gruff. It was a bit of a realism thing. Uh, you know, a man of that time, of that age, in his circumstances. Uh, uh, you know, it's bound to have, be a little gruff, bound to uh, have a little bit of flaws. And the exact reasoning for his demeanor is uh, developed later on in uh, several issues. Uh, we go back and forth between uh, uh, Milan uh, and Antonio's troubles and Cicero's troubles uh, with the demons. And I, I like really how you... Uh develop uh cicero's like characteristics you know he right here saying you know antonio's like can you even read english and uh, you know i i read it i can read it fine and learn from the magazines and here you know he seems timid he seems you know i i wouldn't say you know maybe meek but then you know later on in the issues we see him like performing like demonic rituals it was like two conflicting like like cicero's i loved it like uh what was your reasoning for having uh cicero be like this uh, again, it's a uh, sort of uh, every realistic character has uh, conflicting elements to them. Uh, so what I really strove for for every character is to make them feel both unique and uh, psychologically realistic. So they would have uh, parts that you wouldn't expect uh, and also parts that, you know, come across as possibly negative uh, in mixed in with the positive. Uh, his reaction with Antonio in particular uh, is part of the interpersonal relationship between them. He uh, is sort of subservient in a way, but he also feels uh, indebted to him, uh, which comes from, uh, again, the theme of social contracts uh, and deals that you make with people uh you have to give up something little and maybe that's uh maybe you have to be a little meek to do what they say selling the your being. soul seems to be a running theme in this uh comic you know I, I really i love it and here we get our first taste of uh the demonic you know properties within this book you know what type of research did you have to do uh you know i'm assuming all of this this all like read like it was legit like is this like was this taken from like 
books or or did was this a part of your creative process like you know where did this all come from oh uh yes this is all from the lesser key of solomon uh which i can't remember if i i said this before or after we went live uh the lesser key of solomon was the demonology grimoire that uh really ritualized uh these demons and how to get what you want out of them it gave like a long list of what to do to summon them mm -hmm. and it also the first part of it uh is just a long list of what the demons are what they control and what you can get out of them my man chuck's over there summoning demons what is going on i love it i love it so right here uh, we're getting a look at some of the demons in particular. Are we going to see these demons pop up in later issues? Or are these just kind of getting name dropped? Uh, some of them uh, do show up. Some of them have shown up. Uh, but others are name drops. Others are yet to appear. Uh, one thing about this uh, entire series is that it is full of hints and Chekhov guns and foreshadowing so uh, uh i recently had somebody uh reread the entire series and go oh i didn't notice that detail that mm -hmm. shows up in issue six <laughs> i know just kind of going over it a second time uh, i noticed the uncanny yarns uh so that that was a nice little easter egg that i saw uh, snuck in there as well so here we kind of see more interaction between antonio and cicero uh eating some soup uh and i really like how you know we were talking about this earlier, you know, you, you're able to do dialogue without it reading and, and droning on. You know, I in, in a lot of comics I read where it's heavy with dialogue, it could feel heavy to read. You know, it could, it could kind of be a lot to get through, but this was all very fluid. It didn't feel like I was like stuck on a page for too long uh, before we're heading into the next one. One thing that I did to actually help that, and uh, this is an intentional choice, is making the font size just a little bigger than normal. So I was forced to, by space considerations, cut down any fluff, cut down any uh, thing that didn't reveal a personal trait or forward the plot or add flavor. So uh, if it could go, it went. And I, I like that too, uh, like an ultimatum like that. Sometimes I know for me, giving myself uh, kind of like this, you know, a box to kind of put myself in. And if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. We're chopping it off and, and that's it. You know, I, I spent a lot of time like contemplating on making things fit. So I, I like making yourself not have that option. You know, that seems like it would help uh, a little bit better with the creative process. So what are we seeing uh, happening in these pages between these two uh, in this interaction? I, I noticed right here we have Antonio saying, don't try to start a fight. Uh, you know, is, is there some sort of uh, conflict going on during this talk? Uh, if you'll notice in the background, the uh, sort of uh, uh, wobbly balloons from the radio, uh, those are actually, I had to contact Yale to get these. They're from a... Uh, uh, typescript by Ezra Pound called Corpses of Course. It was near the end of World War II and it was uh, one of it was his most anti-Semitic yet. It was just full of uh, hatred uh, because they were losing the war. Uh, he was desperate. Uh, the Mussolini's government was desperate. Uh, so they're having a bit of a sort of unspoken argument there over where they stand in Mussolini's government. Uh, he's referring here, the we're all Italians now, but uh, one big part of uh, Mussolini's fascism was uh, breaking down the separations between uh, the regional uh, identities of Italy and basically destroying them in favor of one unified Italian identity. So by repeating this, uh, Antonio is sort of putting himself on the side of, oh, maybe I'm with Mussolini's government as this uh, fascist propaganda is playing. Well, Cicero is sort of subtly 
uh, hinting that he doesn't really agree with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, he can't come right out and say it because, you know, he uh, is underneath Antonio's uh, roof and food and uh, feels indebted to him. So that's a little bit of a back and forth subtle argument there. Yeah, I just, man, Antonio, you could tell he's kind of like stuck in his ways, the old school mentality. Uh, this seems like it was such, I I, I, I don't know the correct word. I, I want to say like a hard subject to, 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 to write, you know, making sure that you uh, are able to hit everything that historically happened uh, without, you know, while keeping it in, in a way that's not, I guess, like presented in an evil fashion like having antonio kind of stuck in the, in the middle of it and being conflicted because he's like forced to be stuck in this perception like th- was that difficult for you to to write uh it was difficult it was actually one of the key parts in developing this is making a character who maybe isn't fascist deep down but identifies himself as one uh, so he's repeating this propaganda, but he isn't living it. He's uh, basically a fascist in name only, which is contrasted to the uh, actual fascists that you meet later in uh, other issues. I'm, I'm loving uh, th- this paneling, like blacking out the backgrounds, like how uh, every page feels different. It doesn't feel like the same page scrolling through. Uh, because you know we're going from a, a, a totally white background uh, to a totally black one, and the way uh, the pa- you know the the characters bleed into the other panels and th- the applied lines, uh, you know, I'm seeing it more and more the more you mention it, like right here with the arm and everything. Uh, it's it's awesome, man. I love it. Oh, great, yeah, and uh, especially that page reminded me one other influence is actually uh, period designs from this period, ad designs. Uh, especially from Italian magazines, I was looking over and over. Uh, they had this dark black and white. It had uh, overlapping, and uh, uh, you'll see it used a lot in later issues where uh, there will be a black background and a white background, and one line across both that changes uh, changes shade uh, based on what's easier to see rather than mm-hmm. being one unified line. And it's crazy too. Uh, you see it all the time with the optical illusions. Like uh, so, something will be the same color, a gray, but because of the way a line is drawn, it'll make it look like one side is a darker shade of gray. But it's in the in the end, it's like they're both the same shade. It's it's crazy, like how colors can like do that to your mind. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I really off- like uh, the this uh, the staircase effect right here too. The way you have it like circling down, and and the it's bleeding off the panels right here. Like this is awesome. Oh yeah, uh, there's a big op art influence in here too, uh, which uh, is a bit later, the 60s, but uh, developed a bit from that sort of mentality of uh, ad design. So we see uh, Cicero get the sword and uh, he's getting ready to perform this ritual. And this was like one of my favorite parts. I loved... uh, when he he follows through with it and now that i'm going through this i see like the demon in, in the blade like that was another detail i didn't notice before that is awesome uh and, and you, the way this demon pops out i love it because like this when you see it pop up he looks so big like zoomed in right here he looks monstrous and then we zoom out and <laughs> he's so small <laughs> so this was awesome what uh what were some of the influences for this demon design uh, for the uh, this character, his his name is revealed uh, in the next issue, issue two. It's intentionally left ambiguous here. Uh, actually, was I think the first character that was designed even before Cicero. Uh, he I wanted s- somebody who basically was not threatening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but had a sort of undercurrent of potential menace. Like he's, uh, so oh, he can't hurt me. But then the, some of the things he does or says is, is sort of making me uh, uneasy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that developed uh, into this uh, small sort of cantankerous character. 
Well, his uh, display of power too, you know, like, <laughs> what, you just want to wake me up and just insult me and then, poof, uh, this explosion out. I love the way you whited out this entire scene too. Uh, it seems like he is uh, quite capable of destruction. Oh, no, that is actually the continued bombings. Oh, that was a bomb going off. Okay, I thought that was him, like, looking out to the window causing that to go off. That... So, so uh, no, now, now that, that that makes things a lot more clear too. Uh, which side do you want victory for? Uh, oh wow! And uh, the face uh, bleeding off right here on the side. This was uh, some really deep imagery. Uh, I I, I kind of I really like how uh, it got darker uh, after that. Oh yeah, uh, this is a particularly dark page, uh, both thematically and just you know, there's a lot of blacks in it. Uh, this is also bringing up him sort of waffling on it because of the I see a typo uh, I, I, I have to make a note to fix that typo you know I don't even see it I, I I'm stuck I'm like mesmerized by like the rib cage like you know the bones like bleeding on the forehead and the what appears to be like a rib cage that he's looking through yeah no, I'm uh I am a proofreader uh, and a editor, but you should never proofread or edit your own work because typos will <laughs> happen. Hey, I mean, that's what happens though. You spend so long working on this comic and looking at it day in and day out. It's, it's, it's hard to, to not see like an error. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to overlook that stuff. a bit more uh, symbolic rather than literal uh, in this page, the rib cage and the fire. I, I, and I, I love how like this this creature is so diabolical, but it, it has that cutesy feel to it. It's almost like uh, Lilo and Stitch in, in a sense, like how uh, Stitch is like cute looking, but very, very uh, destructive uh, in his own in his own way. Oh, yeah, he's uh, uh, mentioned that was the key part of that character is having this uh, small uh, limiting the menace was important to developing. Oh, Cicero's uh, going to go along with this because, you know, he can't be that bad, but also uh, keeping a sort of undercurrent of menace also gives it a sort of mystery and also keeps Cicero on edge, uh, adding a bit of uh, storytelling tension. And the way you're able to draw the emotion in his face to the eyes like widening and, and the gleam he is from like getting, uh, getting Cicero to fall into his scheme, like it's, it's awesome. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing this uh, demon get all over Cicero. Uh, Right here, here you can uh, barely hear my heartbeat. It's weak, it's slow. It's like yours is a drum pounding loud and strong. And I, I, I love how we have uh, the heartbeat right here, the, uh, the sound effects circling around. Uh, you really have a knack for just having like your art tell the story without needing to tell the story, like with the lettering, you know. I and I, I can really appreciate that when uh, diving into this book. Oh yeah, that probably comes uh, from, I mentioned earlier, the Gas and Legaff influences. I love how you don't even need the words sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like the sniff right here, like, and the gleam in it. I love it. This guy, this guy is evil. <laughs> and then here's the promise, you know, I could take you to Barbados, uh, but I need you to take care of me. Uh, I'm weak and defenseless. You are not. Uh, you know, you could end the war. I could help. Just take care of me. Uh, just say the word just tell me cicero do we have a contract and there we have the title drop so i i, I love the build-up i'm always a sucker when we get a title drop within the book oh yeah and no, i uh, debated whether or not to whether it was too cheesy but i decided <laughs> i a, a bit of humor in there too and then right here you know deal take me and then uh <laughs> with, with a sna snap of his finger uh, Cicero does not know what he just signed up for and that is the end to uh, issue one So holy crap. That was such an awesome ride. Thank you for taking the opportunity to break that down in depth with me
uh, where can readers find that? Like, what all websites do you have that available on? And is that available for purchase anywhere? Oh, no, definitely. Uh, right now, it is just on Global Comics. Uh, it's not available for purchase anywhere. It's just all free. Over 200 pages are free. So if you have a <laughs> free weekend, uh, then you know, go there. Uh, so Global Comics right now, I'm setting up a Comic Fury website, which will have little bonuses and uh, concept art and uh, mascots. Little mascots telling you all about the page that you're currently on. That's awesome. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. So what's next for you uh, in the future to come uh, outside of do we have a contract? Is this going to be like your main focus or do you have any other projects that you're working on or eyeballing? Uh, let's see. Do we have a contract is slated to be 16 issues, so I'm currently halfway through. Uh, I'm taking a brief hiatus of a few months uh, to work on stuff related to do we have a contract, uh, little side stories. And then after that, uh, I'm actually going to make a comic adaptation of my last project, which was a giant 12 by 12 illustrated prose story with uh, music included. Uh, no, a giant undertaking and it costed way too much to print. Uh, so hopefully <laughs> making a uh, comic version will be, be easier on the pocketbook. No, that is awesome. I, I am always, uh, always happy to hear when creators are uh, making leaps and bounds with what they're planning on doing in the future. And it's exciting to hear that you're only halfway through. So we have eight more issues to come out with. Uh, do we have a contract? Uh, Chuck, thank you so much for swinging by and breaking everything down. This has been such an interesting conversation. And I always appreciate when I get to learn some new stuff uh, that I can, you know, incorporate in future interviews. So before we end things completely, though, I always appreciate asking one question in particular, because as much as this is a podcast for you and your book, it's also a nice learning tool for anyone who might be new or, or even just listening and, and just creating comics th th themselves. So with that being said, for anyone that's watching and maybe struggling with getting their own idea off the ground, what type of uh, advice would you offer them to help them uh, kind of break through that barrier? I don't think I'm the best person to give anybody advice on anything. Uh, that's in for s so many reasons. Uh, <laughs> But if you, if you want to ask about process, I'd say uh, that perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, I Sometimes you have to just settle for good enough and knowing that the next page is going to be better. Uh, that's actually uh, one thing that stopped me before from making a longer term project is obsessing over one image over and over again uh sometimes you just gotta accept that something's not gonna come out good or not gonna come out perfect so you just have to settle for good enough go to the next panel go to the next page and use the learning experience from making a hundred okay pages to make the next hundred pages a little better that see that is so awesome you said you you weren't the best person to ask advice from but you came and hit a home run out of the park with that one i think that is something people can really take and run with i know myself i am a perfectionist so if i was that's a, one reason i'm not an artist because i couldn't stand my art and i know the only way to get better at uh being an artist is to keep creating art and i just i couldn't break through it so maybe i'll take another swing at it because uh that was my issue uh was was just knowing that the next one was going to be better uh, thank you, Chuck. That was awesome. I appreciate the opportunity to break down. Do we have a contract and everything in between? Uh, everyone watching, this has been an awesome Saturday. This is my 150th interview. Uh, what an awesome milestone to be celebrating with Chuck. We are taking tomorrow off. I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break day off from the daily interviews. So be sure to check out Chuck. And do we have a contract on Global Comics to get your fix? There's eight issues currently available on it. When do you have uh, issue nine slated to release? Uh, that's the one that I'm taking starting after the hiatus. So uh, this winter uh, will be issue nine. Okay. Uh, which will be the start of volume three, the third arc. Uh, I don't have a solid re release date yet. I just know that it's going to be uh, 
after September. All right. Well, you guys heard it here first. Be sure to stay tuned in September for Chuck to release issue nine. Hope you guys have a fantastic Saturday, but most importantly, guys, keep it geekly.